Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the campus of Pittsburgh State University, to the Bicknell Family Center for the Arts, and to this beautiful venue, the Linda and Lee Scott Performance Hall. I'm pleased you've joined us for this historic event that serves as a symbol of the energy, momentum, and transformational time being experienced by this institution and its surrounding community. In a few minutes, we'll hear the inaugural address of the H. Lee Scott Speaker Series. But before we do, let's pause for just a minute and note those who made this series possible, Linda and Lee Scott. As benefactors of the series, Linda and Lee have established an endowed fund designed with three specific goals in mind. Number one, deepen the level of campus discourse. Number two, enrich the university experience. And three, elevate the university's reputation. You might ask, how can a speaker series do this? It will do so by examining American life from the perspective of nationally prominent leaders, thinkers, and innovators. Well, Lee Scott certainly knows something about leadership and innovation. A 1971 graduate of Pittsburgh State University, Lee had a long and successful business career, culminating in the role of president and CEO of Walmart from 2000 to 2009. As the president of this university, and maybe more importantly today, as his brother. I'm proud of his record as a corporate leader and the many contributions he made to one of the world's largest and most successful companies. It's important to note today, too, that in many ways, my sister-in-law, Linda, initiated this gift as an effort to honor and recognize the leadership role Lee played on the world stage. And it's fitting that such a gift was directed to Lee's alma mater. Just as he rose from modest means to the pinnacle of American and international business, so too will this gift elevate the status and prestige of Pittsburgh State University. And for that, we will forever be grateful. As Lee comes to the stage, I'd ask you to welcome him, but I'd also ask you to thank he and Linda for this extraordinary gift. Ladies and gentlemen, Lee Scott. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, no. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is overwhelmingly generous. An examination of American life, the subject. As I stand here in this theater and think about the opportunity to be here, I, I must tell you that I am so proud of Pittsburgh State University. Uh, I'm so proud of the Bicknell family for being able to, to lead the way to create an environment like this where this speech could even be held. I'm so proud of the Walton family for wanting to make a donation and Linda in my name that, uh, that would further the opportunity to build this wonderful facility. Uh, and of course, I'm extraordinarily proud of my brother, the, the president of Pittsburgh State University. And as Steve said, without Linda, this day certainly would not have been possible. When Linda and Steve Excuse me for calling you that. I know you like for me to call you Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> when Linda and Steve hatched the idea of the endowed speaker series, I asked Steve who would he most like to have as the inaugural speaker. Very quickly, Steve said, well, I know it's not going to be possible to do it, but I think President Clinton would be the best possible speaker we could ever have. Linda and I agreed. President Clinton, like so many of you and myself, grew up in a small town. He grew up in a modest environment with little likelihood of attaining worldwide recognition. But through his own initiative, his own will, and his own intellect, he became first the governor of Arkansas, then the president of the United States, and of course the founder of the extraordinary Clinton Global Initiative. It's so interesting to think about what he accomplished when he was the President of the United States. 
and how many people in the United States today hearken back to his time of leadership, thinking that it was a time when governance in this country actually worked. He was extraordinarily helpful to me when I was the CEO of Walmart. He was an advisor, an encourager, someone who opened doors for me. You cannot imagine how much pride I have in being able to say to you that the people of Pittsburgh State University in Pittsburgh, Kansas, that I'm introducing the 42nd President of the United States, Mr. Bill Clinton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Dr. Steve Scott, and Kathy, and the whole Pittsburgh Lake family for inviting me here. And I want to thank Lee and Linda for endowing this lecture series and Lee for asking me to come. You could probably tell <laughs> for reasons that are probably a mystery to both of us, we kind of like each other. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll never forget the first time I met Lee Scott, my friend Mike McClarty, who is literally my oldest friend in the world. We went to kindergarten together, and he was my first chief of staff when I was president. And uh, then I made him special envoy to the Americas, and anyway, somehow he and Lee met, and he said, you gotta talk to Lee Scott. He just became head of Walmart. He wants to do something really important with the company, and they're being attacked, and I think it's not entirely fair. Would you please talk to him? And so we talked about what Walmart could do to generate more income by being environmentally sustainable, what they could do to help their workers by developing affordable health insurance policies, and amazing things, and they up and did it. This year, the company reached the milestone Lee promised a decade ago to double the mileage of its truck fleet. They reduced their packaging by 5% when Lee was there, and that took the equivalent of 200,000 cars off the road. Think about that. And I could give you lots of other examples. The point is, I always liked Lee Scott because I thought he believed that his company could do well and do good at the same time. And the title of this series is An Examination of American Life. There's two ways to do this. You could hire a bunch of people to come give you a speech about how, as my friend the late Robert Strauss said, every politician he ever met wanted you to believe he was born in a log cabin he built himself. And no matter how self-made you think you are, that's never true. <laughs> there was always a parent or a relative or a teacher or the person that made you the first loan or something. Or you can think about the lives of the students here, the young people here. At this point in American history, in terms of the great sweep of our country's history, where are we, what are we gonna do? How do you make the most of your life? I prefer that course, because I think it's more useful to you. This country is the longest lasting, continuously functioning democratic government in history. And I think it's because of the peculiar character of our people the nature of our Constitution and our good fortune by geography, location, neighbors. 
we now live in the most interdependent period in human history so far. That is, and I'm not just talking about trade and communication, we, the, the social media, the internet, the explosion of cell phones has made borders everywhere in the world look more like nets than walls. Technology has even made walls less relevant. And we have seen, most tragically in Paris in the last few days, what happens when people use the ability to penetrate borders to advance a certain agenda. Young people persuaded that they are somehow doing God's will to kill totally innocent, anonymous people, and that it's a really smart thing to take about 60 years off their own lives because they'll go immediately to heaven if they kill a bunch of people they never met who never did anything to them or anybody else. That's the downside of technology. But what you what will never be in the headlines, but is in the trend line, is the upside of the explosion of the cell phone and the social media. The fact that there's a website called kiva.org, which enables people for as little as $25 to stake small business people in the poorest country in the world to start their businesses or expand them. And it's created tens of thousands of jobs for people that otherwise never would have had any capital or the fact that the cell phone has done more to increase incomes of ordinary people in isolated circumstances than any device ever. 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when the tsunami hit South Asia, I went with the first President Bush and worked there a year, and then I stayed on for two more years to work for the United Nations. And we put all these fishermen, or if they died, their family members, back in the water in Indonesia, in India, Sri Lanka. This time, however, we put them all in the water with a cell phone. And for the first time in their lives, they knew what the price of fish was up and down the coast. Their incomes went up an average of 30%. What's all I got to do with you in America now? Because you're living in a time when the headlines are bad because of our interdependence, but a lot of the trend lines are good and we're condemned to share the future. So the only question is, what are the terms on which we're gonna share it? And if you believe that, then whether you're in Pittsburgh, Kansas, or New York City, or Los Angeles, California, or the smallest, remotest place in Idaho, the real question is the same. How can you maximize the potential and minimize the peril of this age? How do you make more good things happen and have fewer bad things happen? And what does that mean for the American experience? And is there anything in our history, or our constitution, or our national character which would give us guidance. The first thing I would say is this. Because technology is empowering, all of us have the opportunity, <clears throat> no matter how limited our means, not only to advance our own careers, but actually to do public service, that is to do something that benefits someone beyond your own family as a private citizen. There are now more than a million foundations in America, more than half of them formed in the last 20 years. You clap for Lee because he and Linda are giving a bunch of their money away. It's a good thing to do. You gotta make it first to give it away, but it's a good thing to do. But you don't have to be really wealthy now because of internet giving. When the tsunami hit South Asia, it was the first disaster in history responded to 
over the internet. And we raised million, a billion dollars in America for all those countries. The median one in the middle gift was $56 because it was first internet disaster empowering people. When the earthquake hit Haiti five years later in 2010, closer to home, we gave a billion dollars. Then the median, the one in the middle contribution was $25 because it was the first disaster in history responded to by cell phone giving. And you could type in a number for the Bush Clinton Haiti Fund or the Red Cross or you name it and transfer $10. What does that mean? It means that you can be in the middle of Pittsburgh, Kansas, and have an impact on people around the corner, but also around the world, or any place in between, for good or ill. So, if you believe that we're living in an interdependent world, and all you gotta do is look around, look at the young people here. Look how much more diverse this crowd is than it would have been 30 years ago. Look how much more diverse this crowd is. Somebody like me had showed up 30 years ago, most of the people would have looked like me, old gray-haired white guys in suits. <laughs> I'm delighted that my demographic has not been entirely eliminated from the crowd, I appreciate that. <laughs> but this is a much more interesting crowd. So you gotta figure out what are you gonna do? How are you gonna do it? So here's the American experience. You have to say, okay, this is the world I live in. What do I want to do with my life? And why? Those are two questions no one can answer for you. You have to answer that. The only point I'm seeking to make today is, however you answer it, because of the interdependence of modern life, there has to be some space for advancing the public good in your private life. You don't have to run for office. You don't have to run a big company like Walmart. You don't have to be a school teacher and have a job full-time public service, although it's still maybe the most important job after parenting in any society. But you gotta have some space that shows you're aware that we are gonna share the future and we have to share it on positive terms. If you decide that, then you have to figure out if I know what I wanna do and I can give a good answer to why, how will I do it? How do I turn my positive intentions into positive changes? How do I really make something happen? And I believe that what works best is inclusive policies, inclusive politics, inclusive economics, inclusive society. I believe that because you live with all this diversity and the question is, is it gonna be a source of strength, joy, and interest, or is it gonna be a source of anonymous bombings? Paris today, Mali the next day, whatever. And all over the world, this is happening. People's identities are being jarred. If you had grown up when I did, right after World War II, yeah, you know, my log house was, what Arkansas had, the per capita income of Arkansas was about half the national average, a little more, 56%. Nobody in my family or anybody I knew had ever gone to college. 
I spent a lot of time with my great-grandfather when I was a little boy, and he's still the oldest man in my family for the last three generations. He lived to be 76. And he lived in an old house built up on stilts out in the country. He had a few head of cattle and a storm cellar because Arkansas was a tornado capital of America. It was basically just a hole dug in the front yard with steps down to a little cot and a coal oil lantern. And I used to love to go down there and spend the night even though there were occasional snakes and spiders and other things I had to sleep with. But we lived at a time when if you had a place to sleep, clean clothes to wear, and you had enough food to feed anybody shut up at the door, nobody thought they were poor because everybody thought they could find a job and be a part of a coherent family and a coherent community. It made life worth living. And we, like everybody else, caught the great upswing of the growth of the American middle class after World War II. For all the turmoil of the 1960s, I didn't know anybody that wanted a job that didn't have one. And uh, I told Lee on the way in here, we were talking about West Virginia, and I said, you know, I just I ache for coal country because our country has done such a bad job of helping people make economic transitions. And there are two counties in West Virginia now where the main source of income for non-college educated males is a disability check. But it's not like we hadn't been on notice. Coal employment peaked 100 years ago, 95 years ago, literally. Coal production peaked in 1950. We lost, in the first decade of this new century, more than 20,000 jobs before the CO2 rules were tightened just because natural gas became more plentiful and cheaper. But we didn't measure it very well. So what am I saying? There's part of this interdependence has been accompanied by a great uprooting, which is in America manifests itself by economic dislocations across race and region. And that is manifested in small town and rural American dealing with opiate drug epidemics. Something my foundation's worked hard on. We got naloxone, the best life-saving antidote to people who are suffering from opiate overdoses. Finally, it's been approved by the FDA in a nasal spray form. And we, we got it out this week and we're gonna have, make it available to people who can save lives for about $40 a dose savings. It's a big deal, but it's a tragedy. That is a part of our interdependence too. So all over the world, in neighborhoods everywhere, you are seeing a crisis of identity. Who am I and how do I relate to you? And do the differences between us make life more interesting or more deadly? In other words, am I at a point now where in order for me to be proud of myself, I have to think less of you if you're of a different religion or a different whatever, you name it? Or is there some way for us to affirm our differences in a way that makes us stronger? And is there anything in our history that tells us about this? Yes, there is. The Founding Fathers wrote a constitution in which their number one goal was to stop any individual or group from being able to dictate to the rest of the country exactly how to live. They divided power, executive, legislative, judicial, national, state, local. The president could veto an act of Congress, but a supermajority of Congress could override the veto. The Constitution could be 
amended, but three quarters of the state legislatures had to vote for it. Everywhere you look in the beginning of the Republic was the desire to create a government strong enough to meet the challenges that a new country was facing in the late 1700s, flexible enough to change over time because they knew circumstances would change, but always divided enough so that different voices would have to be heard. I told somebody, if you really look at the history of the Constitutional Convention, if you read the Federalist Papers, the Constitution of our country should have had a subtitle, Let's Make a Deal. <laughs> now, you're all laughing, but before I came here, I was over at Senator Bob Dole's center in Lawrence, Kansas. We're, we've been good friends for many years. You know, we ran against each other for president in 96. We never stopped being friendly. And we never stopped doing things together as long as he was in the Senate. And when other people in his party shut the government down twice, he rolled his eyes and he said, they'll get over it, just hang in there, we'll get this done. In other words, we thought we were supposed to disagree and agree. We were supposed to engage in combat and get something done. So that's the first thing I want to say. The American Constitution kept any of us from getting dictatorial power in the hope that it would force all, force all of us to work together. And in an interdependent, diverse world, if you want identity politics to be positive, not negative, then compromise and cooperation has to become an honorable thing, not a disgrace. And I, secondly, second thing I want to say is, I could fill this auditorium with the academic studies proving that diverse groups make better decisions than lone individuals or homogenous elites. Suppose, for example, we could, suppose we could miraculously find the person in this auditorium with the highest IQ. You guys ever watch Scorpion on television? I'm home alone a lot. I see a lot of TV now. So, you got, so anyway, Walter O'Brien had a measured IQ of 197. He was a real live human being. Um, okay, so, Let's suppose we find a person here who has the highest IQ in the room, and we take you out and give you the nicest space in this gorgeous building. And for two days, we cater to your every need. Whatever you want to eat or drink, whatever music you want to listen to, you got it. The rest of us poor folks are stuck here together, eating increasingly stale food, drinking increasingly cold coffee and warm soft drinks. And for that two-day period, someone feeds the same set of questions into the genius and into us. After two days, we'd make better decisions because this is a very diverse group with different knowledge, different experiences, different takes on things, different instincts. We would make better decisions. So to refuse to work with others in a country with a culture that mandates it, a legal system and a political reality that mandates it, in the face of all evidence to the contrary, is an error, I think. The second thing I'd like to say is, in addition to all that, we actually know what works. We can look at the periods where we've all worked together and we've done better. So if you wanted in this deeply divided country, in a deeply divided world, to create a climate in which you personally, whether you ever run for anything, could actually bring people together and do things, what do you have to do? This is my five minutes on leadership stuff. 
<laughs> you got to be interested in three things, people, policy, and politics. Politics is different than if you never run for anything. I believe that I never would have been elected president if I hadn't been in, born in Arkansas at the end of World War II without a television. I was 10 years old before my family ever got a television. We couldn't afford to take out-of-state vacations. I did get to drive down to the Gulf Coast and spend two nights in New Orleans when I was 15. The only out-of-state vacation we ever had. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> what we had was the county fair, the occasional square dance going through town, and our meals, storytelling. And our best meals were always at my Uncle Buddy's house. He was my great uncle. He had a sixth grade education, and I would say probably 170 IQ. He was the smartest man in my family, in a way. And when he was in his late 80s, he could remember the bird dogs he'd owned in, when he was in his 20s, what they looked like, how they hunted, what they did. He was so smart. In 1980, when I was the young Democratic governor, I became the youngest ex-governor in America, defeated in the Reagan landslide. And um, my Uncle Buddy was the first person that told me I was going to lose. I was 40 points ahead in the election. That's how smart he was. <laughs> then when I ran again, he told me I was going to win. But here's the, by far the most important. When I was a little boy, We'd sit around, and they had no entertainment except for the weekend square dances and the county fair, except mealtime stories. And in our family, you could not tell a story until you proved you could listen to one. So he'd look at me and he'd say, Bill, did you hear that story? And I'd be talking about some guy that, you know, ran the hardware store. And I'd say, yes, sir. And he said, what did you hear? And I would have to repeat it. Then, if I did that, if I wanted to tell a story, I could. I was usually too intimidated. But it was hilarious. They taught me that everybody was inherently interesting. My mother's father, my grandfather, he owned a little grocery store in the African-American part of our town. It's hard to make a segregated town with only 6,000 people, but we managed to get the job done. <laughs> and his customers were mostly African American, so he'd have me over there all the time, giving the kids cookies, playing in the backyard. And the cemetery, the town cemetery, was right across the street from his store. And one day we walked over there, and then my grandfather walked me to the very edge of the cemetery and said, that's where these kids you've been playing with live. What do you notice? And I said, Papa, there's no pavement on the streets. He said, that's right, son. He said, they all live on dirt roads. Don't forget that. They live in the same town, but they're living on dirt roads. The point is, I had all these really smart people with not much education who understood a lot about other people and had their eyes open. So that's what I would say to all of you. It is a blessing for you to be out here in a place that's big and sophisticated enough for you to be in this pretty building, get good teachers, learn a lot, but small enough for you to remember the most important thing at all. Everybody has a story. Everybody. And people want to be treated with dignity. We work all over Africa now with my aids and agriculture problems. I love my favorite thing to do is all this work we do with small farmers. I mean people farming an acre. It's like being in a, the American South before the Depression, back in the 20s, and when, what we're doing. But anyway, in 
a lot of these places where there's no roads, nobody's got any wheel transportation, everybody meets each other walking. And they, here's the greeting. Hello, how are you? And the response in whatever the language of the Central Highlands and countries just below, translated into English is, I see you. Morning, how are you? I see you. It is a deliberate, conscious effort to confer dignity on people. and to remind yourself that you're not the only person in the world. It's an incredible thing. The first time I saw it, I couldn't believe it. And then I watched it and I saw how it made people more aware of their surroundings. And that people were still being raised in the way that my folks and my grandparents, my great uncle and great aunt tried to raise me. You just think about the number of people that go about their lives every day who think they have nothing in common, who feel that they are never seen. People that used to have jobs mining coal and now can hardly bear to look at their kids in the face because they're living on a disability check. When they're really not disabled and they got good years left, but they have no other option. We have to deal with that. We have to see people again. We have to see through their color of their skin, through the way they worship God, through what they do for a living, through even what they say their politics are. Hillary's mom died a couple years ago and she was almost 92. And she lived with us for many years. I adored her. But she was way the most liberal person in my family. And yet, unlike everybody else in my family, she watched an hour of Fox News every day. <laughs> and it's interesting. <clears throat> and so I was, you gotta understand, my wife, my mother-in-law, whom I adored, was basically abandoned at age eight with her five-year-old sister and put on a train to go live with relatives going from Chicago to California alone on a train to go live with relatives. And when she was 14, she was essentially kicked out of the house and went to work as a housekeeper for somebody else till she got her high school degree diploma. I mean, it's an amazing story, but anyway, so I remember sitting down with her one day, and we were watching Fox News, and I said, Dorothy, how come you watch this? And she said, because, Bill, nobody's right all the time. <laughs> Nobody, and I need to know what they're saying so I know what the answer is, and once in a while I agree with them. And she said, it's just too bad that people who watch it all the time won't watch anything else. She said, because I do, and I think that's important. I see you. I had an eighth grade science teacher named Vernon Doki, who was a retired coach. This story is 56 years old. And I remember this like it was yesterday. So Vernon Doki was married, his wife's name was Verna. Vernon and Verna. <laughs> and Ms. Doki was an American history teacher. And her sister, Mary Metathlon, was my geometry teacher, an algebra teacher. They were late 40s, early 50s, extremely attractive women, sort of neat, petite, tight hair, straightforward, but really attractive. Vernon Doki, to put it charitably, was not a handsome man. <laughs> he wore big Coke bottle glasses, he had a big nose, he smoked cheap cigars in an old plastic cigar holder that pinched his mouth up. And he, no matter how much weight he gained, he never bought bigger shirts. <laughs> but I loved him. 
He was a good science teacher. He made things interesting. But in the last class of the day, he said, the year, last class, he said, kids, let's face it, when you get out of here, you're not going to remember anything you learned 10 years from now in eighth grade science. So he said, if you don't remember anything else, you remember this. Every morning, when I get up, I go into the bathroom, I put water in my face, put my shaving cream on, I shave, I clean it all off, I look in that mirror and smile and I say, Vernon, you're beautiful. <laughs> he said, now you remember that. Everybody wants to believe they're beautiful. And if you just remember that one thing, it will take you a long way. 56 years later, I still think old Vernon was beautiful. We, none of us in an interdependent world where we're clanging up against each other can afford not to see people. Think of all those, think of the kids that committed suicide to murder innocent people in Paris. They didn't anymore see those young people at those restaurants at that concert venue, then a man in the moon. They weren't human to them. Person trying to get into that soccer stadium to blow themselves up. I'm telling you, you have to have an interest in people as individuals, not in the vast mass of humanity, in the people as individuals. Then, if you want to make a difference, you have to care something about policy. Lee Scott, as president of Walmart, decided that he would take a company known for providing low-cost, high-quality goods that the customers could bring back if they were dissatisfied with, with no questions asked, and turn it into a major sustainability company. This year, the company, Walmart, kept a commitment he made 10 years ago to double the mileage on its trucks. Before he ever left, he had, by simply getting its suppliers, oh, by the way, it saves him a billion dollars, doubling the mileage. He made a commitment to get its suppliers to reduce their packaging by 5%. That had the effect of taking 211,000 cars off the road. You get it, whether you believe global warming is a big problem or not, I think it is, and I do a lot of work on this. It's good economics to change the way you produce and consume energy and other local resources if you're smart about it. You can create more jobs and more businesses. So they did that. They've gotten rid of 75% of their waste in most of their operation. They don't put food waste in landfills anymore in many of their operations. He did that. Now, it's one thing to say you're for something and quite another to figure out how in the heck to do it. That's policy. And then the final thing is politics in a broader sense, not running for anything, but there's politics in making any sort of change. Niccolo Machiavelli said in the 15th century, <clears throat> there is nothing so difficult in all of human affairs as to change the established order of things. For those who will benefit are uncertain of their gain, while those who will not are positive of their loss. <laughs> Sound familiar? So that brings me back to the point I was making in the beginning. In an interdependent world where a small number of people can do a world of hurt or a world of good, you need an inclusive stakeholders decision-making process with the goal of having inclusive economics, everybody willing to work for it, it's got a chance to get a fair income, inclusive politics, you listen to somebody even when you disagree with them. And inclusive societies, you don't have anybody to waste. 
the American journey has reached the point now where a life in America should be at the most exciting time ever. Ask the successful people here. I think about the world, what I think the world looked like in 30 years. I'd rather be an American than anywhere. We are younger than every rich country on earth except for Ireland, and they're small. We would have been younger than China in 20 years if they hadn't changed their one-child policy. I'm for immigration reform because in a global economy, the more diversity we have, the better, and because there's no evidence that there's been a substantial displacement of American and jobs by immigrants. There is some discrete evidence, like when that consulting firm in India made a deal with Disney World and kicked a bunch of people out of their IT jobs in Orlando and made them train their successors. And when you can find that, we should stop it. But in general, every immigrant with a college degree or more coming to America creates two and a half more jobs. And they keep us young. Having lost it, I can tell you, youth matters. <laughs> Just as a sheer economic fact of life, it matters. You want, in a global economy, to have a diverse, youthful, entrepreneurial workforce. So that's what I think. Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion works. Networks of cooperation are producing good results all around the world. One of the many trips that I had the honor of taking this year was at the request of the government of Singapore and the government of the United States to represent our country at the funeral of the founder of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who died at 90 a few months ago. We were friends, and I admired him very much, and whenever I was anywhere in the neighborhood, I'd try to drop in in Singapore and just sit and visit him. He was an astonishing man. The country was founded in 1962. He was the first prime minister. Then after he left, he became the senior minister, a full-time non-paid advisor. Then when his son became prime minister, time after him, not, not right after, but later, he was given a title called minister Men mentor. His wife had passed away and he spent the last few years of his life sleeping on a cot next door to his office. When he became prime minister of Singapore, the per capita income of the country was $900 a year. When we had his funeral, 55,000. Biggest increase in per capita income in the shortest amount of time in human history. And I listened very carefully at his memorial service to what people said. The first speaker was his son who talked about what a good father he was. The last speaker was his son, the prime minister, who talked about what a good leader he was. In between, there were all these people who represented every religion and ethnic group in Singapore. It's quite a diverse operation. And the bottom line is this. They said he did many things right, but the most important things he did right was absolute intolerance, zero tolerance for corruption, first value on good education, and making people proud of their ethnic and religious heritage, including teaching many of them for the first time their language in the school, but making sure everybody spoke English because that was gonna be their language of commerce. And they understood that the thing that made them ab be able to be proud of their ethnic heritage and their religious heritage was the fact that the government protected theirs and everybody else's too. So that there was like zero negative identity. And in one way or the other, all these people that had worked for him got up and said that. That's what we have to strive for. 
No one can promise you that nothing bad will ever happen. But what you want in American life is for people without regard to their race or religion or where they live to have the same sort of stories that Lee Scott and I have. I mean, there'd only been two governors in a small state ever elected president. Nobody would have given you a nickel for my odds of ever being president. And contrary, uh, let me say this, if any of you ever get elected president, you'll be shocked at the number of people who say, he told me or she told me she was gonna be president when they were six years old. It's all bull. <laughs> They'll say that. But the most important thing is to be for something that's bigger than you to decide what you're gonna do, why you're gonna do it, and then inform your life with an obsessive interest in people, a working knowledge of policy, and a skill at politics, and politics broadly, how to turn your good intentions into real things, action. The most important thing I did for you, arguably, as president, over the long run, maybe even more important than the only period of shared prosperity across all income groups in 50 years. Or, wait, wait, or paying down the debt by $600 billion instead of running it up or a lot of other things. Most important thing was I spent $3 billion of your money to finish the sequencing of the human genome. And we have received in the last 15 years, 800 plus billion dollars in economic investments, as well as genuine advancements in cancer treatment and trying to unravel the secrets of Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and lots of other things. You probably, you probably, now, but for the purposes of this talk and the American experience, Here's all you need to know, whether you're interested in microbiology or not. As a citizen, the most important finding of the human genome research to me was that every non-age-related difference you can see in this audience, the color of your skin, the shape of your eyes, the shape of your body, the color of your hair, even your gender, is rooted in one half of 1% of your genome. Otherwise, we're 99.5% the same. Now, therefore, for us to go into the 21st century with all of these amazing scientific discoveries and economic possibilities out there, and all of these genuinely serious economic challenges out there. We've got non-college educated white Americans with their life expectancy going down in this country. You've got these drug problems, you've got all these economic problems, all this. For us to spend all our time fretting over our differences is crazy. It's crazy. We all need to resolve. When you go out of here today, if you don't do anything else, just promise yourself you're going to spend a tiny bit more time than you normally do thinking about the 95, 99.5% you've got in common with other people, and maybe a tad less about that half a percent. Because it is now a very clever biologist were here arguing with me. Say, look, everybody's got 3.6 billion genomes, so half percent's a considerable number. That's true, but the truth is this scientific discovery confirmed the lessons of almost every religion. Christian New Testament, most important commandment, love God. Second one is like unto it, to love your neighbor as yourself. The Torah, he who turns aside a stranger might as well turn aside from the most high God. The Quran, 
Allah put different people on the earth, not that they might despise one another, but they might come to know one another and learn from one another. The Dhammapada of the Buddha, in some ways the most interesting of all, says no one can be fully human unless you can feel the arrow piercing another's body as if it were entering your own. Look, this is not rocket science. We cannot afford on a modern stage with super powerful weapon and borders that look more like nets than walls to pretend that our differences matter more than our common humanity. Especially when the most interesting, prosperous time in human history awaits us. But we've got serious economic transitions to undertake in America so that we can all participate in it. Everybody's willing to work. The good news is, if we have universal broadband and five or six other things, it won't matter if you live in Pittsburgh, Kansas, or Silicon Valley within a few years. You'll be able to access the potential of the 21st century world. That's what I want for you. That would be the apotheosis of the American experience sparked in the 18th century by people who believed that if we love the right things, liberty and freedom and individual rights for everybody, and we were willing to use our brains to think, and we weren't ashamed to listen to our neighbors, but worked with them, we could change the world. In the 21st century, we are going to share the future. The only question is, what will be the terms of the sharing? If you want to be a really good citizen, you got to come down on the right side and fight for the right definition. Thank you very much. I'd ask you to uh, remain still while the president uh, greets the students. It, it is worth noting, I think it's important, the president asked that, uh, that the students would be seated in the front area. And he wanted to speak directly to them and acknowledge them. And he's doing so now. What a wonderful statement that is. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> How about that?
We, we've, been at, we've been asked to stay just a few minutes while the president clears the building and then also his motorcade uh, leaves the parking lot. That'll make the exit a little more smoothly for all of you. And I know you've been sitting here for quite a, quite a period of time, so I appreciate your patience with that. Uh, I think we're looking into offering three hours of credit for that speech. Uh, that, that was an amazing, amazing speech. The depth of what his comments were. I want to watch it again. We'll have that up uh, on our website. And uh, we know the web stream didn't quite work like we wanted it to, but this will be up very quickly after the speech. So I know many of you will want to go back and capture some of those minutes again. That'd be exciting for us to see that one more time. But what a, what a historic moment this has been and what a beautiful speech that was. What a great person. I know, I know Lee has exited with the president, but let's give one more round of applause to Lee and Linda for their generous gift. Thank you, Lee. Uh, in addition to Lee and Linda, I, I think it's important to point out, and I'll stop doing this at some point, but just think about the 600 and some donors who contributed to make this building possible. Thank all of you. Thank you very, very much. And while I can't mention all 600, I hope you'll forgive me if I mention the name of Gene Bicknell because he is here. Gene, thank you. Great job. Great job. As, as Gene would want me to point out, there are many other people who helped, but Gene, you, started, you got it started, and not bad for three guys from Baxter Springs, Kansas. How about that? <laughs> All right. Go Baxter Springs. Also, I do want to thank Kathleen Flannery, our advancement uh, vice president, just has uh, done a terrific job interacting with the, the Secret Service and other members of the Clinton staff. Also to Joe Furman and his team who did a great job getting ready for the day and this event. Thank you, Joe. Many of you were here last night for the Mamma Mia performance. The stage looked different, right? So Joe's team turned the building very quickly to get it to this, to get this beautiful facility and beautiful look for the H. Lee Scott Speaker Series. So, you know, a really important note to make right now, too, is our students ran this event. Students were on the light board, students on the soundboard. This was a student-run operation, and that's terrific. And also, one more comment about Mamma Mia. It was just a terrific uh, event last night via Christy Pittsburgh just did a great job of helping us with that. They were our co-sponsors. So another shout out to Via Christi Hospital Pittsburgh. Thank you guys, thank you very much. <laughs> Finally, just a couple more comments. Uh, you, may be, you may be wondering who's next, and we've had some comments, and some people have said, who can follow Bill Clinton? And now after we've seen that speech, it's, yeah, who can follow Bill Clinton? But you know what? We're up to the challenge. We will figure our way through that. In the next few months and few weeks, we'll be developing an advisory committee that will be looking for that next speaker and identifying that speaker. And, and our speakers are going to come from a wide range of disciplines and interests and perspectives, including leaders and innovators from business and government, technology, science, medicine, the arts, and military. So we have a broad range of group of people that we'll be looking at to, to bring to the campus. We want them to be prominent individuals. People are known in the public domain, not just in their specialty areas. You can see today what a great opportunity this is to advance Pittsburgh State University. What a, what a terrific moment this has been. Good for Pittsburgh State University, good for this community, and certainly good for our great students who sat here in the front uh, close to the president. You'll want to watch uh, BicknellCenter.com. I like to give that website regularly for all the exciting upcoming events and also information about the next speaker series opportunity. So keep track of that. We'd love to see you in this facility. It needs to be full, right, Gene? That's, what we, that's why we built it. We want you to come and be a part of this campus and be here for all the events that we have our, coming our way. With that, we would wish you safe travels, and thank you so much for being a part of this very, very special day. Thank you, and good evening. <laughs>